till I felt his loving arms embracing me. truth found in that song. Amen. Have your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter number 30. The book of Exodus chapter number 30. Those of you in here, those of you listening by way of live stream, we'll mention a few things before we get going in the message this evening. And some of it's going to be about the song. I'd like to say that there's probably no doubt those listening by way of internet or live stream or whatever it may be that you can't be here and it's may, it may have been a little while since you've been able to be at the house of God around the people of God and I just want to encourage you a little bit and tell you that he is enough and that he will be enough for you. In the times that seem hard, in the times that seem difficult, in the times in which you feel like, man, I'm ready to give up, and uh, maybe you're hurting, or maybe you're sick, or maybe you're weak, or maybe you're watching a loved one that's struggling, or a loved one going through things, 
and it is weighing on you, it's burdening you, it's hard on you, I'm glad I got one this evening that I can go to and that I can let have my burdens. I mean, I'm talking about the old songwriter said, roll them off on him, amen. That's why 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 7 said, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. We think about how he said, Come unto me, all you that are laboring, heavy laden. Now I'll give you rest. So if you're listening this evening, you're not able to be here, and you're discouraged, and you're downhearted, and you think, What can I do, preacher? I'm glad that you've asked, because there's something you can do. You can go to Jesus. He'll help you. He'll be a friend closer to you than any brother could have been or possibly been able to be to you. And I want to be a friend to you. I want to love you, but nobody loves you like Jesus. Nobody's been a friend to you like Jesus. In the hard times when it seems like you just can't go on, that strength that gets behind you and pushes you, that's Jesus, amen. In the difficult times where you feel like just throwing your hands up and giving up, if you'll realize you can throw your hands up and just praise the Lord, it'll help you a little bit. You'll go a little farther because you'll be in the uh, Spirit of God that'll be helping you along the way. So I, I I want to just encourage you tonight if you're listening by way of live stream and you're listening by way of internet to keep on going, press on. We ain't got time to give up. We ain't got time to give out, but we need to keep going for the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll realize you won't be running in your strength, amen. You'll be running in his. And when you get to that place, you'll know, praise God, that he is enough. And, and then there are those that can say tonight that I have been through enough to know that Jesus is going to take care of me. I have been through uh, dangers and trials, through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come, hallelujah. And it was grace, amen, that brought us this far, and grace will lead us home. We think about that old song, Amazing Grace and what that'll do for you in a time like this. I realize that maybe uh, that you have a, a shelter in place or maybe you can't get out and you can't get around uh, 10 or more people. I'm glad that this evening, even what the message is about, amen, that I can get in the presence of a thrice holy God. Now I can get a hold of him and I can talk to him when nobody else wants to hear from me. Oh, man, I can tell you it's going to be good this evening. Nobody else wants to listen. Nobody else wants to hear what i got to say. There's one in heaven, amen, wants to hear what you got to say and is interested in what's going on in your life and where you're at. So praise God. Let's open the scripture this evening to Exodus chapter number 30 and we'll see what the Bible says. Those of you that are in here, let's stand and reverence the reading of God's word. We'll begin in verse number 10. If you're listening at home, follow along. If you've got babies around next to you, have them follow along in the word of God. I believe the word of God is what does the work of God in today's day. Amen. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 30 and verse number 1, and thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shittim wood, shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four squares shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it by the two corners thereof upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it. And they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once 
in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask you to please touch the word of God tonight. Touch my lips, O Lord, that I would say what only you'd have me to say. God, I pray you'd use the message to speak to the hearts and the minds of your people. Lord, help us tonight. Encourage us through the scripture. God, let us see what we have because we have your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us see our standing because of where he is seated tonight. Let us see, praise God, where we're at because of where he is. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you would forgive us of our sins and where we failed you. Lord, forgive me from where I failed you since the last time we spoke earlier today. Cleanse me, wash me, make me white as snow. I pray, Father, you'd give me the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost to preach in tonight. Touch my lips, oh God. I ask you to help me to stand where no man can stand without thou being with him. We'll give thee the honor and the glory for all that you do. For it is in the Lord Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen and amen. Man, thank you. You can be seated. Thank you for standing with us. Now, I want to continue where we've been for the last several weeks now in the study of the tabernacle. I didn't read just by the time constraints of verses 34 through 38, but we could read there. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee the sweet spices, stack to and Annika and Galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense of each shall there be a like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, you shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Notice it's for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. You see, the, uh, the stringent things that God puts on these as far as if something happens that is not supposed to happen that way, they'll be cut off from the people of the Lord. Now, I would also like to mention just by way of introduction that it's uh, been two weeks ago now that we looked at the lampstand or the candle candlestick as we come through the scripture. We were uh, over earlier on in Exodus, but we're making our way through the tabernacle. That is what we're looking at tonight, the study of the tabernacle. And that is, if you want to title something, you can title it that, but it will also be on the altar of incense. But when we think about how the candlestick was there in the holy place, we consider the table of showbread, how it was in the holy place. We haven't come on the outside or the outer court yet. We're kind of working our way backwards. We started out in the holiest of holies or the most holy place where we find the Ark of the Covenant but where we also find the mercy seat. And so we find ourselves tonight as we think about being in the holy place and we think about this golden altar of incense and how that Christ is the light inside of the holy place. I mentioned two weeks ago when we were coming through this that we find there the um, the candlestick or the lampstand. There's no windows in the holy place. There's no other way for outside light to get in. There's no worldly light going to be involved in there. The only light that we find in the holy place is the light that is given off by the lampstand or the candlestick. And I'd say this concerning that. That is the Lord Jesus Christ in uh, this world. Uh, that He is the light of the world. We found that John the Baptist said that he was a light bearer. He, he is not the light, but he comes to bear witness of it. And I uh, mentioned that uh, two weeks ago about ourselves, how we are light bearers. And we find that there was a seven as coming off of that candlestick. There was uh, the center that come right up the middle and then there was the other lamps that come off and the limbs and the branches that come up with the knops and uh, the almond leaves and everything that was on it. So we found that that six was the number of man, how it represented us. And 
and we uh, bear light uh, unto what that is in the center of which number seven we know to be perfection. We also know Christ to be perfect. There's nothing more perfect than the Lord Jesus Christ. So we find the candlestick giving light. It's giving light for what's taking place right here in Exodus chapter 30. And to begin with, we'll look at this underneath the study of the tabernacle. Underneath the altar of incense, we'll find the production of the altar. If you'll look with me, please, in verse number 1. The Bible says, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Then it says, Of Shittim wood shalt thou make it. If you've paid much attention throughout the study of the tabernacle, you've seen where uh, this wood was used in many things. And, and so here we find it being used with the altar, the golden altar of incense. Then he also says this in verse and number three, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. First, I'd like to mention for a few moments thinking about this wood. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 25, I'll flip back over there and mention we find this wood first mentioned in Exodus 25 and 5. And ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood. The thing about this wood is that it was a very durable wood. It was one that was found there on Sinai where Moses was. It would have been easy for Moses to be able to get a hold of the wood and been easy for him to be able to use there in the tabernacle. But um, it's also a representation when we think of Christ. Christ is seen in everything in the tabernacle. Anything and everything you find represents and points to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've mentioned in days gone by that he is, the, the tabernacle is one of the most perfect types of Christ. It points to the one that is to come. It also points to the one that is in glory. That's why God told Moses that he would build it after this pattern. There must have been something that Moses looked at. There must have been something that Moses seen. And so that would have been the pattern of the one that's in heaven. And so understanding that everything points to the future or to the one that is to come and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see this concerning the wood. It is also a symbol of humanity. We think about how that wood is here and we think about how Christ was made human and Christ uh, was uh, took upon himself the form of a servant. He became man. He became sin for us. He who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him is what the Bible says. So uh, considering this wood that it's being used for, it is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. But then secondly, notice this about the materials. The Bible says this. Notice that the, it says in verse number three, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. They don't just say that you're going to use a little of this and a little of that and mix it together and then pour it out in a mold or pour it underneath that or over that and overlay it in everything that you can find. That's not what the Bible says. We do find, however, that they found one of the most precious, if not the most precious material that we think about today is gold. We think about pure gold. Some people would have 10 carat, 18 carat, 24 carat, or whatever gold, and it's like whatever carat it is is whatever worth it is. Now think about this. This wasn't all that. It was pure, amen. This gold was about to be overlaid on this, on this altar of gold, of incense. And what they're going to do and what this represents is we're thinking about Christ and him being seen in everything as we see how it represents his royalty. Now you consider one thing. When we think about something that's precious, you think about today and the, whether it's in the reserve or whatever it may be that they've got, that they're wanting to back money with other than that being gold used to back our money. If we were going to use gold and the gold standard is still there or was still there, we'd find that in place. But consider this. That would be the most precious thing we could figure and the most precious thing we could find. How be it that the God of glory has the most precious thing in the world and that is his son the Lord Jesus Christ and he sent him to be the propitiation for our sins and not for our soul but praise God the sins of the whole world is what the Bible says and so considering Jesus how does this typify him or how does this bring a type of him it brings it around to how he is precious he is far more precious I'd say this is there anything this evening that is more precious than Jesus Christ well that's an easy answer I'd lift my hand like D.L. Moody and say no 
thousand times no because there's nothing more precious than Jesus this evening. He is the most precious thing. That is the most precious name that can come off of your lips. That is the most precious thing that you can tell somebody of. And some would say, man, I have to, I look like a pauper this evening. Well, if you're saved by God's marvelous grace, uh, you're heir to a throne. Amen. Hallelujah. It's what the Bible says. We're kings and priests is what Scripture tells me. Don't, don't lower your head and walk around with your head down thinking that, man, I don't have anything. If your name is written in heaven, you've got more than what the world has to offer down here. This gold down here, that don't mean much because, praise God, up there they're walking on it. There's a street of pure gold in heaven, amen. When we think about gold and the representation and the royalty that is found, the divineness that is seen, when we think about the, uh, the, uh, the production of this altar and we think about the, um, the gold that is being used and how that represents Christ as in his humanity, but then Christ in his deity, that's what gold would represent. They brought gold unto him. and They brought and offered gifts unto him. We find gold being there, and that's because he is God, hallelujah, in the flesh. God and man became one. It was a 200% individual. His 100% man, 100% God. You ain't seen that anywhere else but in Jesus, amen. We find that the uh, production of this altar, it matters. But not only do we find that the materials that were used matters in the production, but then we see this, the measurements that are given. The measurements that are given. The Bible says in verse number 2, a cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four squares shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. We find the measurements that are given if we accept a cubit being 18 inches, which most people do, and then we would think that it was a foot and a half by a foot and a half, and it says four square. Then we think it was three foot tall or 36 inches. If it's two cubits, 18, 18 is 36. And so just giving you an idea of the table uh, or giving you an idea of the altar of incense and how it was and the way that it was and roughly three foot tall and how it would look and that they would be offering on that things and using that, but that's not all we find. Yeah, maybe all we see in the measurements, but then we find this in the making of it, if you will. Underneath the production, we find the making. What all's involved or what all's entailed in this making? The Bible says in verse number two, if you'll look with me there, at the latter part of the verse, it says, The horns thereof, the horns thereof shall be of the same. So thinking about this thought of horns is going to be found on it. Not only do we see that, but look in verse number three. The Bible says, speaking of it, it says at the latter part of the verse, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. We find a crown that is seen here in this making of the altar of incense. Then we also see this in verse number four. The Bible says, and two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it. We find the golden rings, the two golden rings that are there. Then if you look in verse number five, the Bible says this, and thou shalt make the staves of Shittim wood. So we find staves as well that we see involved in the making. We'll go back just for a moment. We'll look at the horns for a second. We find this as well on the brazen altar that is on the in the outer court. We'll look at that more later on. Be uh, Wednesday night or so down the road. We'll see it and we'll also notice horns being uh, talked about there. But horns here in the on the altar represent power. You say, why would you say that? Well, the Bible says in the book of Psalm, if you'd like to turn there in Psalm chapter 75, I'll read just a couple verses there and then turn on over unto a different Psalm or two and read some more verses. The Bible says in Psalm 75, and I believe it's in verse number four, we would see what Scripture tells us concerning the horn maybe. It says this, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Then it says in verse 5, Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. Then the scripture says in Psalm 89, I believe in Psalm 89 and 24. We'll flip over there and see what the Bible says. In Psalm 89 and 24, scripture says this, But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. And so we find the horn being used there. Then the Bible says in Psalm 112 
and 9. This is what the scripture says here. It says this. He hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever, his horn shall be exalted with honor. We find that as we come through the scripture and think about this, the thought of the horn and how it represents power and how the Lord mentions, we even find things about a horn over in Revelation and how uh, this horn does uh, something, the little horn does things to the other ones and, and telling us what the scripture shows there about power. A horn is represented Presentation of power in the scripture. And so here we find horns on the altar. And can I say this? If we'd like to flip over, and I'll flip there. We're going to use our Bibles a little bit this evening. Praise God. Hallelujah. In Matthew, in chapter number uh, 28, most of you would know what I'm getting ready to quote or what I'm getting ready to read out of the scripture. But in Matthew, chapter number 28, and in verse number 18, the Bible says this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We find the power that is mentioned there in uh, Psalm for, in chapter 112 and verse 9. We find that his horn, his horn, whose is that? That's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ that's mentioned there. It's going to be exalted and honored would be there with it. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is seen here in this thought of the power speaking. But I want to mention this. Yes, horns on the altar represent that there is power. Think about this for a moment because we think about an altar and what's done here on this altar. Upon the altar of incense, we find prayers being offered. We find this thought of prayers going up. That is what it's referring to, and we'll look at that more in detail in a few moments, but I got something to say about this power and this thought of prayer. We think about how power is found on this altar, and if you want to understand some things, you find somebody that prays a little or don't pray much, you'll find somebody that's not going to have a whole lot of power when it comes to the Christian wall, when it, cry, when it comes to the Christian life. But you find somebody that's been in the throne room of grace, you find somebody that's been around the God of the throne or the throne of God, and you'll find somebody that the God of the throne has been around, and therefore you'll find that there's power in that individual's life. I'm talking about spiritual power. I'm talking about one that don't come from here, don't come from this world, but it's one that comes from the spiritual one and from another one that is to come. Amen. This is what the Bible tells me in the book of James. If you'd like to turn over there, I'll just read a scripture in James. In James chapter number 5, the Bible says this in verse number 16. Scripture says, and confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Notice this. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Don't tell me that there's not power when it comes to prayer. But then when we think about this power, can I give you just a few illustrations? I'll only give you two out of the scripture. We find one by the name of Daniel. Daniel, I'll tell you what you can't do anymore, Daniel. Daniel, you're not going to bow your knee anymore. And this is why. Because there's an edict been put out. There's a decree that's been said. And you're not going to go against the decree, Daniel. We know that. And so Daniel goes back to his room. He shuts the door and he turns toward Jerusalem like he would every other time. He gets on his knees and starts calling on a thrice holy God. And the God of glory hears Daniel don't think that he don't. And I want to say this this evening just because some people think, man, I'm going through a hard time that God must not be hearing me. That God must not be with me. That God must not be helping me. What happened to old Daniel was uh, they come after Daniel and said, well, king, here's what Daniel was doing. Daniel was on his knees like he normally would be, and we heard him. Others heard him. What do you think? What we're going to do with him is throw him down there in that lion's den. Then Daniel finds himself in a lion's den, and then we think about man prayer really got Daniel in good shape, didn't it? It put Daniel off down in the lion's den. So some people tonight, if you're listening by way of live stream, or if you're in here, may be thinking, I've been praying and praying and praying, uh, but it ain't been like I've been getting anywhere. I've done found myself in a harder place than I was before I started praying. I want you to understand that Daniel may have found himself in a lion's den, but praise God, the same God in which Daniel was praying to is the same God that, that was in the lion's den with him. He's the same God that gave those lions like jaw. He's the same God that brought Daniel out there the next day. And he's the same God that had power and influence with the king in which Daniel knew. And he knew that Daniel was going to be there. He knew that he'd already told Daniel the day before that God in whom you serve will deliver you, Daniel. And so he goes down there asking for 
for Daniel. Daniel comes up out of that lion's den and Daniel says, I'm here, O king. He comes out of there and then the other men go in there with their families and at about that time, the, the lions figured out that they were hungry and they devoured them. Don't you tell me that prayer don't work. Well, let me give you another illustration just for a moment and we'll move on. When we think about power that's on an altar, amen, we think about Elijah. Consider him. Elijah's talking unto the Lord and here Elijah goes. He's about to head up on Mount Carmel. Elijah's about to have some things happen. Elijah looks around at those, uh, those uh, false prophets of Baal and tells them to call on your God and let's see what he'll do. And he says, wait a minute, you better call louder because apparently he ain't hearing you. Maybe he's off somewhere. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's doing something. And so they begin to even cut themselves and things of that nature. Then old Daniel, oh, 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 Elijah says, I tell you what, do you go get some water. Now think about this. It's a drought going on. He says, you go get some water, fetch me some water and bring it up here and I want you to fill up this around the altar. And he says, I'll tell you what, do go ahead and pour it on the altar. Wet all that down real good because I want you to understand that there's a God that is seated in glory and who hears me when I call. And he calls on the Lord and we know that when he calls on the Lord, the fire comes down upon the altar and licks up the water that's even around about that altar. Amen. It consumes the sacrifice it consumes the water and we find the power of God through prayer. Now think about that because there's some people that say, well, it don't matter whether I pray or not. It don't do anything. I tell you what don't do anything is not praying. I tell you what does something, praise God, is praying and keep on until something happens. Amen. God in heaven hears. We find there's power that's represented on this altar because of the horn. We find there's power represented in prayer. And we think about this as well. We think about the golden rings and the staves that we found in the scripture. But the Bible mentions them. Now I want to say this. It shows us. It shows us how it was mobile and would go wherever the children of Israel went with the tabernacle. He put the rings on there. He had the crown. Well, let me go back for a moment. There was a crown on there, amen. And that crown represented royalty as well. It represented a king as well. And that is exactly what this altar was in representation of, was a king one day that was going to come and is to come still. But then we see this. We think about how that thing was going to be moved, how it was going to be taken. And if the tabernacle was moving, so was the altar of incense. If the tabernacle was going and the children of Israel were going, so was that altar. There were, they were not going to leave the altar of incense behind. Now I'd like to say this this evening concerning the thought of prayer and concerning the power that no matter where you go, no matter where you're at, you can get on your knees, amen, and you can call on God because wherever that is, he goes with you. You're never alone, amen. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a promise that you got from the Lord. And so how about you use that power in prayer and you call on God, amen. Not only do we find that there's a production, but then we see this. Secondly, we find there's a placement of the altar. The placement of the altar. Look with me in verse number six, and we'll hasten along. Won't be, won't be too long this evening. The Bible says in verse number six, and thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with thee. We find that the location of this placement or the location that is found in the altar, when it was, it was put before the veil. The altar being close to the center of the holy place. Now we consider the holy place is where the priest just the, the priest would go and do the, their daily duties and minister before the Lord. Now hold on a minute because let's don't get that mistaken with the holiest of holies. There wasn't but one going in there. That was the high priest. The, re the priest, I don't want to just say the regular priest, but the priest would go in the holy place and the priest would do their daily duties and minister there in the holy place. Offer up, pray offer up uh, the incense and the sacrifices that would be taking place in there. But we find that it was there in the center of the holy place. We find that it was very close to the center of the veil. And we also know that the veil is what is separating the priest from the holiest of holies. We also know that that's what's keeping him 
him from being in there with God. Now, can I say this? That where we find the altar of incense is before the veil. And can I say that if you're going to get in the presence of God, you're going to have to get on your knees to do so. If you're going to get a hold of God, it's going to be through prayer. And don't think you're just going to be walking along one day and then the God of glory is hearing you. You'll be calling out to him if he's hearing you. Amen. But we understand that the placement that is found here and the veil that is there, we know it's no longer there. The veil's been written in twain from top to bottom. And we know that veil to be a representation of his flesh. Whenever it was, that it was ripped, whenever it was scourged, whenever it was cut and brutally beaten, that is a representation directly of the veil in the temple. That's what Hebrews tells us. Well, back over to James for a second because I'm going to read another verse out of James. In James chapter number 4, the Bible says this in verse number 8, if I'm not mistaken. In James chapter 4, verse number 8, we find that the Lord is telling us some things in His Scripture. Uh, we know the Bible is given by inspiration of God. Hallelujah. All of it is. Well, it says this in verse number 8. It says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. One thing I want you to understand, that when it comes to getting a hold of God or being in the location of where the Lord is and finding this placement of the altar, how it was before the veil, my friend, the veil is gone, and now we have direct access. And what we can do is we can get on our knees, and as the priest, as close as the priest could get, was at the veil, and the veil is gone. Amen. And so the saved individual can come into the very presence of a thrice holy God. God, we have a greater access than what the priest had in that day because we have a great high priest in whom lives and dwells within us because of the Holy Ghost and we can go directly to God. Amen. And thinking about the altar of incense or thinking about this prayer or thinking about what it does for us. Now I want to say this in the third point and it will be the last one and we'll be through. We find not only do we see the production, not only secondly do we see the placement, but thirdly and lastly Actually, we see this, the purpose of the altar. The purpose of the altar. I mentioned earlier when we think about uh, incense and we consider this thought of prayer. Prayer is a very special thing, but it's a very important thing. It is always a type of prayer and praise that is offered to God. In other words, the incense is. But then I would say this. In verse number 1 it says, And thou shalt make an altar. And so we find, and I'll go here just for a moment, when we think about the purpose of an altar, in Genesis in chapter number 8, what long ago I was in a meeting in Brother Chris Hewitt was preaching, doing a phenomenal job talking about Noah and how he built it an altar. Well, in Genesis in chapter number 8 and verse number 20, for those of you that are following along by way of Scripture, we find something here, and this is what we find. The very first time that we see the word altar used in the Bible, that's also called the principle of first mention, if we want to find out what it means or what it's talking about. Well, in verse number 20 of Genesis chapter number 8, the Bible says, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took every of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The purpose of the altar was for a sacrifice or for an offering. And can I say this uh, concerning the thought of Noah here? We find that Noah had brought maybe seven clean beasts of this kind after its kind and seven clean fowls after its kind. Now I want you to understand why there's more clean that got on there than unclean. Because God had already knew, praise God. God already knew when they was going to get off the ark that there was going to be offerings and sacrifices made. And God, hmm, hallelujah, God had already prepared what was going to take place when they come off the ark. Now I want to say it like this, that when he got off the ark he literally had to build something and he built an altar. You've heard the old saying, a family altar will alter the family. Family. Brother Chris did a wonderful job that night preaching on a family altar. It helped me, amen, in my own life, my personal walk, and my family. But I want to mention this concerning the thought of offerings and sacrifices. Do you realize uh, for something to live, I mentioned this on Sunday night, I believe it was, something has to die. 
die. And for an offering to be made, something has to give up something to offer. And so for when we think about Moses or when we think about Noah and how Noah gets off the ark and Noah builds an altar, his boys are watching him build an altar. His boys are seeing as they get the offerings together. Maybe he says, go get that clean beast of the, of the goat or the lamb or whatever it may have been. Go bring that with you, son, because we're going to offer that a sacrifice. It's going to cost us something, but praise God, it means much more for what we're doing than what we would have done with it if we wouldn't have given it to the Lord. And so right here at this place, we find that when the Lord, the God of glory, hallelujah, how he had already made preparation for an offering to be made. Can I say before the foundation of the world, before Adam and Eve ever messed up in the garden, God had already in his heart prepared an offering, a sacrifice, an offering thou wouldest not. Oh, praise God. But a body thou hast prepared me is what the Lord Jesus Christ said when we reckon Scripture. And in Hebrews, we see how the Hebrew writer goes back into Psalms and pulls that out. And we think about the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he laid himself upon an altar, how his blood was placed upon an altar. And so on this altar, when we think about the purpose of it, we think about an offering being given. We think about something being offered up. We think about how it costs something. And so tonight I would say this, and in Revelation chapter number 8, I'll flip over there as we get ready to go there and read a portion of Scripture there and what the Bible says. In Revelation chapter number 8, in verses 3 and 4, the Bible says this, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense. Now remember, we're talking about incense over at the altar of incense in Exodus 30. It says this, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now let me ask you something. What was before the throne? Exactly what we're talking about in Exodus in chapter 30 that the children of Israel was going to build after the pattern of the one that's before the throne. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So then we find this. We find in verse number 4, and the smoke of the incense... Which, cut, which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. You see what happens when that incense is going up? And so are the prayers. As God in heaven smells that sweet smell and savor of those incense and God in heaven smells what he has already said. These spices shall you use with frankincense. And there's no other spices that's going to get used. They're not going to use no strange incense. We done seen that in the scripture where it said not to do that. So exactly how God has planned it is how he's going to smell it. And he's not going to smell something else and be like, oh man, that'll work. No, it's going to be exactly what he has planned. And you know what happens when that takes place and the prayers of his people are going up. He hears a prayer from his people. Now we find this as well. We think about over in the book of Hebrews. This is what the scripture says in Hebrews chapter number 13. We'll go there. In just a moment, we'll be done. But in Hebrews chapter number 13, the Bible says this. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse and number 15, it says, By him, remember I said that on the altar of incense, sacrifice was to be made. There was to be an atonement. Praise God. We'll go ahead and get this while we're here. There was to be an atonement for the altar of incense. It was once a year, blood would be applied. It would be to make it holy and unto the Lord. Well, the Bible says this. That would have to happen once every year. Annually, it would take place all your generations, he says. Well, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 15, the Bible says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. You know what that sacrifice of praise is? That's prayer. That's literally praying. It takes something from you to pray. It takes something from me to pray. We have to sacrifice to get on our, now you go ahead and write it down. The flesh don't want to do that. You can act like it does all day long out there in, uh, in live stream land. You can act like, man, I love to pray. I, that's my favorite thing to do. But your flesh and that don't like it. The flesh ain't interested in it. Sometimes you have to try to keep your head up and pray. Sometimes that's why. Why do you think the Lord went unto Peter and the disciples said, Could you not pray 
with me one hour. He says that then he talks about them and being asleep. He says, just stay with me one hour. Why are you asleep, in other words? You know, when we get to that place, sometimes it's discomforting having to get down. Maybe if you get on your knees or if you're just riding along, you have to try to focus and stay focused. So it takes it from you. You have to give and offer something up unto the Lord. Well, the Bible says this, that sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. When you're giving thanks unto God, praise God, that's a prayer going up to the Lord. But then we see this as well. I believe that in verse in number 16, he goes on to talk about something. He says, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. We understand that a sacrifice this evening that was made for us on the cross at Calvary, I'm wrapping it up right here, that the sacrifice that was made for us in the Lord Jesus Christ enabled us to be able to come to the throne of grace and not have to have anything else and be able to offer up our prayers and praise and thanksgiving by our lips under the God of glory. You say, how'd you get to the altar of incense? Because here we go. In Romans chapter number 12. I told you I'd be through. This is it. In Romans chapter number 12, the Bible tells us, and you already know where I'm going, if any of you know much about the scripture, in Romans chapter 12, in verse number 1, I can hear Paul now. As Paul is talking to the church at Rome, as Paul is talking to the Romans, and as Paul is mentioning unto them how the God of glory sacrificed, gave up, offered up himself, and that was a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. A sacrifice that only had to happen one time. A sacrifice that didn't have to happen over and over and over. It was once and for all. Hallelujah. What a sacrifice. Well, we think about uh, we sang earlier, talking about giving our all unto the Lord and how we should give it all to Jesus. Well, the Bible says this as Paul is beseeching them. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, no Notice this, a living sacrifice. Where does a sacrifice go? On the altar. That's where a sacrifice would be made. He said, you present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, that's what it was going to be on that altar of incense. It'd be holy. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Some would say, well, all I can do, all I can do is just give him what I got. Or I ain't got much. The most you can do is give him yourself. A living, he don't want a dead sacrifice. A living sacrifice, the greatest thing you can do is say, here am I. Lord, use me however you want to. Do with me what you want to do with me. Whatever it may be, that's it, Lord. Here I am. Offered on the altar a sacrifice unto the Lord. He says, this is your reasonable. Can I say the least you can do is offer yourself unto the Lord. The most you can do is the same thing as the least you can do. And that is offer yourself a living sacrifice. I gave my life for thee, the songwriter penned down. What hast thou given for me? And we think about an altar of incense. We think about how an offering is to be made. We think about prayer and what prayer can do. I will tell you, at this time, at this time, it's high time God's people get up and pray. Or maybe I say this, get down and pray. Whatever, it don't matter to me. Standing, sitting, driving, laying prostrate on the ground, that's all well and good. But it's time God's people call upon the God of glory. I'm not in a day and age in which we live when people think, man, there's no hope. When the, when the liberal media, that'd be all right, when the liberal media is trying to express there's no hope today, trying to create fear in everybody. Here's one thing I'll tell you, there's hope. It's hope in Jesus, amen. We ought to give him Jesus. Give the world the Lord Jesus Christ. Sacrifice yourself upon an altar, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable service. It's what the Bible says, and it's high time that some do that. Now, I'll also say this. There's people sitting at home right now, probably listening by way of live stream. There may be some in here who think, well, there ain't nothing we can do except pray. Prayer is not an exception. It's not like the exception of the well, we better just go pray. I guess that's what we do. No. That ought to be the first thing we do. 
We ought to be talking to the Lord first about things. Getting a hold of God first in our, in whatever it may be that's going on. Well, I guess all I can, it ain't all you can do, it's the most you can do. Read your Bible. You'll find it out. In many other lines, that altar of incense, I'd say it like this and then I am done. The altar of incense. It's high time that we get an altar for ourselves and get a hold of the thrice holy God. Let him hear our voice. Let him hear from us. The beautiful thing about the Christian life, I don't have to go up the road to a priest somewhere. I am one. It's what the Bible says. Revelation chapter number one. Go read it. I don't have to go find somebody to pray for me. Praise God. I'm glad I can call on people to pray for me, though. I'm glad there's prayer warriors out there. But we ought to all strive to be a prayer warrior. Somebody ought to be able to call you and say, hey, so-and-so, can you pray for me? Will you pray for me, please? And you ought not have to say, well, give me about 30 minutes. I've got to go get cleared up some things. No. You ought to be able to say, yeah, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now. That should be the way it is. Why do you think that altar of incense was in that holy place? We wasn't having to worry about how long it was going to take. It was going to have to do this. No, when those incense was upon that altar, they were offered up unto the Lord, and he smelled it then. They might not have been able to go beyond the veil, but tonight we have the privilege to go beyond the veil because it's gone. The veil is gone, amen. We can go directly to the Lord and offer prayers. Father in heaven, I love you this evening. I thank you and I praise you for all that you do. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the study of the tabernacle. I ask you, Lord, to keep working, to keep working in the Bible, working in our hearts, helping us, O oh Lord, Help our nation. Touch our nation. Lord, we need it. We need you. We don't need someone else. We need the Lord. We need you to work. I ask you, Lord, please help us. Please work in a mighty, wonderful, marvelous way. We'll give you all the honor and all the glory for it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do pray. Amen. I encourage those of you that are in here and if if the live stream is still going, and I see that it is, that's good. I'm going to encourage you listening by way of live stream. Uh, for those that are part of our church that's listening, uh, a letter will be in the mail. I don't know if you didn't receive it today. Lord willing, you'll get it tomorrow or Friday explaining some things. But I also want to mention this, that in that letter I said that let's try to encourage one another. Let's try to be an encouragement one to another. You don't ever know uh, what a phone call might do. I would say a text message, but I ain't a big texter. Um, I just assume hear your voice. But you don't ever know what a phone call might do, what an encouragement might do for someone, how it might help someone that is literally on the verge of just wanting to quit, and how you may help someone like that. If you would just call them up, Tell them, hey, I just want you to know I love you. I've been praying for you. I've been thinking about you. You know, if the Holy Ghost puts somebody on your heart, he does it for a reason. He don't just do it. Just You can be like, oh, yeah, that person's cool. They might be going through something, and they may need you. And it'd be good for you just to call and be like, hey, I just want you to know the sweet spirit of God puts you on my heart, and I, I, I want you to know I'm praying for you. And if anything I can do to help you, if I'm able, I'd love to do that. So let's be an encouragement to each other in these times. Um, and Lord willing, come Sunday morning on the broadcast here, on the live stream, and here in church as well, I'm going to be giving a list of prayer requests um, for people to hear. I want you to hear who we're praying for, what's going on. I know Wednesday night's prayer meeting. But I say this to all of you listening. Um, there with your family. Uh, I would ask you to get around your family. If we got daddies out there listening, I'd say this, daddies, get your wife and get your children and get a hold of them and if you grab them by the hand or whatever, don't matter to me, and uh, get on an altar somewhere, whether you use a couch or love seat or I don't care, table, don't matter to me. What If you just get in the floor, don't matter to me. But you get them and you call on the Lord. You ask God to do a work in your home, in your life, in your family, and trust that God, I, he hears you. If there's no sin between you and the Lord, he hears you. You're reading his word, you're abiding in his word, doing what his word says, he hears you. I promise you that. And I'd say this, if there's mothers out there, maybe daddies ain't home. 
I'm not saying they've just left. I'm talking about maybe they're at work. Uh, you get them babies. You get them babies and you pray with them. They'll know. They'll remember that. I remember my mama praying with us. I remember my daddy coming in late at night and us being in the bed. I've said this a couple of times in the last few new services and praying with us there while we were in the bed. I already went off to sleep. Mama done prayed with us before we went to bed, but daddy done come in there and prayed again after we was asleep most of the time. It's important to pray. Teach them babies to pray. Teach them babies that when you call on God, he answers. He answers. Let them know. Hey, there ain't no shame in letting them know. You know, the cupboards are a little bare, but we're going to ask the Lord to do something. And then when he fills the cupboards, praise God in front of them. Let, look what the Lord's done. Look how God's worked. Done filled the cupboard. Praise God again. And in a few minutes, we may go back to preaching. But uh, you pray with them. Show them the importance of prayer and what the Lord will do. Pray for one another. Hold each other up in prayer. I didn't say this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. There is a ministry that Christ is performing right now in heaven. He ever liveth to make intercession for us is what the scripture says. Now, that just come to my heart and mind. I'd have preached it a moment ago, and if I ain't careful, I'll preach it again. But that's what Christ is doing right now. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. We need the Lord. We need one another in these days. I ask you to pray for wisdom for our leaders of our country, that, that God would let them know what to do. And can I also say this for some that may be listening by way of live stream, that maybe your church doesn't have a live stream or in the process of getting a live stream or something of that nature so that, you're, uh, that you can listen to y'all y'all services. Please pray for your pastors. Please pray for your pastors. Pray that God give them wisdom on how to do things, how to handle things in the near, uh, in the near future, in the days ahead. That God show us what we need and how we need it. I ask you to be doing that. Um, we're going to dismiss in prayer at this time and ask the Lord to bless. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we get to come to thee. Lord, I'm so thankful and humbled at the thought that he would even look down upon man, that you're mindful of us. As the angels say, what is man that thou art mindful of him? But Lord, at the pinnacle of thy creation was man. And thy creation turned against the creator. But still you had a plan. And redemption, sacrifice was in that plan. To draw me unto thee. Woo me to thee by the Holy Ghost of God and reconcile me unto thee by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray tonight that you'd bless. I pray for our members of our church, O oh Lord, the flock that you allowed me to be the under-shepherd of. I pray, God, that you'd help them, touch them, and be with them tonight in every place that they're at. I pray, God, you'd keep them safe, out of harm's way, healthy, Lord, from sickness. I've had messages today of others that are sick, I pray, God, that you'd touch their bodies. I pray though, for those that have asthma, Lord, that you'd help them. I'm thinking of specific ones in my heart and mind right now. God, you touch them. Lord, those that are being affected by a virus, Lord, whether it's the one going around or maybe the flu or pneumonia or whatever it may be, I pray, God, that you put a hedge of protection about my people, your people, oh Lord. Keep them safe. For those that are hurting tonight, I pray you touch them and help them and be with them. I believe that you're able to exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power which worketh in us. You said in the word of God, the book of James, you have not because you ask not. So Lord, I'm asking you to do a work in our people. I pray for our country this evening, Lord. I pray for our leaders. They're in dire need of wisdom. I'm asking you to give it. I thank you for those that I do believe love you that are in leadership. Protect those that are Christians. Lord, I know that they have a, what seems to be an impossible fight, but nothing's impossible with you. All things are possible with you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for our local government. I pray for our governor. I pray for Brian Kemp, God, that you'd help him and touch him. Give him direction on how to do and what to do. Give him wisdom. I pray for my pastor friends, Lord. I prayed for all of them today already. But I pray for those, Lord, that are hurting tonight, those that are sick. I, 
Think of other pastors that are literally in the hospital because of the virus that's going on. I pray you'd be with them, meet their needs. Touch their flocks, O oh Lord. I thank you for the church of the living God. I pray you'd touch, touch your bride. Pull your bride up close to your side, O oh Lord. Help us to know that you're just right there, that when we call on you, you hear us. We'll give you the honor and the glory for everything that you do. Keep us safe tonight as we travel and go our separate ways. In Christ Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.